the parts to replace it or bring in a new one that's blocked by the embargo. And number three, because we targeted electrical grids, as the, for the rolling blackouts, it requires less fuel to run the generator for one incubator than two. This was the malnutrition in Iraq. This was the state of Iraq's children. So also through this time, we were bombing Iraq. A lot of people forget about that, but the no-fly zones were actually bombing zones. This was indiscriminate bombing, and I will show you through one example of Omran Jawer, that eight years ago yesterday, he was tending his flock of sheep. He had just finished school for the year and was getting ready for summer vacation. 13 years old, living in a small rural village, farming town in southern Iraq, uh, about 30 kilometers outside of Negev. This was Omran, and on that day, American planes were circling overhead uh, and, for whatever reason, uh, launched an attack that injured uh, four of the other shepherds who were with him and his relatives, killed Omran, and also killed uh, between 20 and 30 of his flock. Now, this image is actually from Afghanistan in 2006. But for a population that is suffering, poor, and starving, when we come in with aerial assaults that do this to their, their source of livelihood, their source of survival, this has a tremendous impact on the people living there. They don't hate our freedoms. They hate us because our policies are destroying their lives and killing their families. Marsh drainage. Now this is actually on uh, what's something that the Ba'ath Party was doing. After the first Gulf War, there were uprisings in southern Iraq because we encouraged the Shia leadership in the south to go rise up and remove Saddam Hussein. And we said, go ahead, we will be there to back you up. And so they said, okay, we're going. And then the Americans never showed up. And for some time, there continued to be rebellion in the south. So what followed was systematic drainage of the marshlands just north of the city of Basra, where my father is from. Now, the party at the time said that this was, they were doing this because there were drought conditions and they needed the, um, the water for irrigation. But in reality, it was likely to uh, displace those people who were rebelling against the government. Uh, and this resulted in drying up the wetlands and mass displacement of the people. And also during this time, as if matters were not bad enough, uh, nature uh, contributed with a drought. Between 2000 and 2003, there's now a new drought today. I'll come back to that. This reduced the wheat crops to less than half of the grain production that uh, had existed 10 years before. And the population, therefore, became more dependent on the food rationing system that was coming from the government. So but in that period, with economic sanctions and bombings and marsh drainage and, uh, and drought, it's estimated that between 1.2 and 1.8 million Iraqis died. The percentage equivalent for a population of 26 million compared to a population of 300 million, that's as if another country's foreign policy killed almost 14 million Americans. Absolutely devastating. And now here we come to shock and awe. These are my pictures. This is from uh, April, or March, sorry, March 2004. This was the Ba'ath Party building in Basra, which was targeted as a government building. You can see the devastation that, you know, we make really good bombs. Um, and they can destroy buildings. And you see physically what can happen. We can only imagine the noise trauma of uh, a bomb hitting. But this is 2004. Ladies and gentlemen, I returned two years later to visit my family. And after two years of reconstruction, here is the new Ba'ath Party building. This is what Iraq looks like. There is devastation throughout the country. The only construction that's taken place is number one, on military bases that belong to Americans and British. Number two, building walls to create ghettos in Baghdad to divide up families and um, workers, in, especially in Sadr City. Iraq's seed industry, going back to the agricultural aspect. Before 2003, they had a well-functioning, centrally controlled seed industry that had developed over the years a rich seed variety for almost every variation of wheat in the world today. And the farmers in Iraq accomplished this by saving their seeds and sharing them and replanting them. Well, after 2003, that system was destroyed. 
The research and seed production facilities had significantly deteriorated, uh, also by years of sanctions as well as looting. Um, they had a national seed bank that had seeds dating back thousands of years since the early farmers. It's gone now. And now the supplies of seed demand are supplying only 4%, and that's back in 2005. Now, Paul Bremer came in after the invasion, um, and you may know uh, Bremer's 100. If you do Pilates, that's a little bit different from the Pilates 100. This is Bremer's 100. Um, that's a joke for those of you who don't do Pilates. Um, his first 100 orders, which were decreed, and no elected Iraqi government that comes after Bremer has the power to alter them, which is apparently the foundation of a democracy in someone's book, um, not the dictionary. Anyway, Order 81 is important because it affected the agriculture in Iraq and um, it's got a legal name, patent industrial design, undisclosed information, integrated circuits, and plant variety law. Well, through all the legalese, basically what Order 81 says is that farmers shall be prohibited from reusing seeds of protected varieties or any variety mentioned in items one and two of paragraph C, blah, blah, blah. So basically what it says is Iraqi farmers are not allowed to save seeds. They are not allowed to share seeds, no sharing, and they are not allowed to replant it, harvest it seeds. Now, why would Paul Bremer do this? Well, let me tell you a little bit about Monsanto. Monsanto has terminator seeds, genetically engineered seeds that, as you probably know, produce plants that do not make seeds, which makes farmers dependent on the corporation for seeds every year. Now, Monsanto and Dow Chemical and the Cargill Corporation, they all have an interest here because they're all manufacturing either the seeds or the chemicals to treat those plants with. And they need a place, a laboratory if you will, to try out their new toys. So Cargill Corporation, a grain conglomerate, uh, their former vice president, Daniel Amstutz, was made the agricultural advisor to Iraq, also a former USDA official. Now this was, it was very staggering to me and also very clarifying for me to understand that across the board, from agriculture to mercenaries to oil, this is about corporate profit. And these corporations were like drooling on the possibility of using their terminator seeds there. Iraq becomes the laboratory for genetically modified wheat. They gave Iraqis, Iraqi farmers, six types of wheat to grow, only six. Three of them are for wheat for pasta. Iraqis don't eat pasta. So a population that is starving to death is given seeds to make half of their production for exports. And who's going to make money off of that? Not Iraqis. They are the guinea pigs in this experiment. And despite the food insecurity that is at heightened desperate levels today, the food rationing system that started back in 1990 is due to be terminated next month. That's thanks to the influence of the World Bank and the IMF. This means starvation, which pushes people to be more dependent on any crumbs that the corporations hand to them. Sick and wrong. So daily life for Iraqi farmers today, there's no law and order. They're living in chaos. Daily house raids, they continue to this day by Iraqi police and their supervising American soldiers. There is limited electricity and water which means that there's no irrigation. You need electricity to run the irrigation. And what water is available is contaminated with sewage, so you can't really use it to irrigate your crops. Now there is a new drought that is emerging, which is heightening the food crisis. The American-run Ministry of Agriculture is doing nothing to help out the farmers. IEDs have a particular plague for farming towns. For example, the town of Haditha. In Haditha, an improvised explosive device went off, killing a Marine. The rest of his unit responded with great anger to avenge that murder and massacred 24 people, the families who live nearby. When a roadside bomb goes off, the instinct is fight or flight. Well, unarmed farmers in their fields are going to flee. And um, many American soldiers take that as a sign of guilt, and they get shot in the back. It's, there's no accountability over there. It is Lord of the Flies over there. And so the only option is to bring the soldiers home. 
Environmental destruction, as I said, now there's less than 15 million date palm trees today, according to the Department of Defense, and our use of depleted uranium. And I know I'm running close on time. But if you don't know it, then depleted uranium is basically radioactive waste. We have tons of it stockpiled around the country. I live in Denver, so please come visit. We have depleted uranium stockpiles. We have nuclear missile silos. I'm going to be, work for the advertising board for the state of Colorado. <laughs> but anyway, uh, DU, as it's called, happens to be the most dense material on Earth. The only natural occurring element that comes close is tungsten. And that's very expensive to mine, and we don't have that in this country. There are a lot of uh, uh, resources in Russia. But what the Pentagon found with all this free stuff sitting around, actually it's not free because it costs money to maintain radioactive waste. But they found that if you formulate that DU into rods or tip it on artillery shells or put it into a, a gun that fires 50 millimeter caliber rounds, um, as specifically in the rod shape, it can cut through a tank like a hot knife through butter, which is very, very exciting if you are the Pentagon. But there's a problem uh, beyond uh, my problem with uh, fighting wars. But uh, on impact, DU burns and aerosolizes, just like spraying a spray can. And it goes into tiny, tiny microscopic particles that go into the air and the sand and for the people, the water supply. Now, after the first Gulf War, where we used over 300 tons of depleted uranium in southern Iraq and Kuwait, the Pentagon sent their number one geophysicist to go check out what the results were, Major Doug Rocky. And what his findings were was that you should never have used this. You should never use it again. You need to educate the civilian population on what we've exposed them to. And you've got to educate returning soldiers on what they've exposed them to. Well, ladies and gentlemen, depleted uranium is our Agent Orange. The Pentagon says that depleted uranium is fine. You can eat dinner off of it which maybe you can, maybe the head of the Department of Defense uh, likes to go home and eat off of dinner plates of depleted uranium, more power to him. But in reality, when you breathe it in and you drink it in, it's gonna settle in your lungs and your kidneys, and then the tiny, tiniest pieces will be able to cross into the bloodstream and go systemic. The most likely etiology of Gulf War syndrome is depleted uranium, and it's, this waste is radioactive. The Pentagon said, Doug, thank you so much for all your hard work. You're fired. Now, the effect for the uh, returning soldiers is a population of between one and two million, which is uh, probably, well, certainly since uh, 2003. For Iraqis, you have an entire population that has been subjected to DU. And studies done in 2002 at the Veterinary College of Basra University found the onset of new cancers in animals in Basra, seminoma in rams, mesotheliomas is lung cancers in buffalo, and ovarian cystadenomas in dogs. So if it's affecting animals, it's affecting people. And in Iraq, after the first Gulf War, there was a 600% increase in Iraq's infant mortality rate and 300% increase in the incidence of pediatric leukemias and lymphomas which are blood cancers. And now that shock and awe has come, I said after the first Gulf War, we used a little over 300 tons of depleted uranium. Today, over 2,000 tons and counting. In Iraq and Afghanistan, it was also used by NATO in the bombing of Kosovo. And now the increased cancer rates, which had been concentrated in the South after the first Gulf War, which is where bombing was concentrated, are now appearing in Baghdad. For American soldiers, as I said, most likely cause of Gulf War syndrome is exposure to, to, to depleted uranium. A third of soldiers who have served in Operation Enduring Freedom are now presenting to the VA for medical complaints. And the VA cannot handle it. That's not even psychological trauma. That's medical complaints. And what it led to, it was found that there, were, there was significant increase in the congenital abnormalities in the children of veterans of Desert Storm, 1991. Normal children before Desert Storm, after their service, children with abnormalities. Uh, there's a, actually I forgot to tell you, the point of my website is to back up the information I tell you because it's so different from what you'll hear in the mainstream media or absent there. So there's a section on further reading. 
and there's a section on depleted uranium and you will find the life photo essay called the tiny victims of desert storm or you can do a search on your own you don't have to go through my website but I'd like you to but anyway this is documentation that uh, the significant increase was being followed but then there was no further funding to uh, continue the studies 